Hi accounting class, it's another great day to do some accounting. Today we're doing this for the online accounting pro, uh, principles of accounting too. So this is for the online principles of accounting too. There's some relationship between the face-to-face, -face, but the face-to-face -face class shouldn't uh, focus necessarily on this video. You can learn some things, but some of the approaches are different. It might just get confusing. So this is primarily for the online students taking principles of accounting too. We're going to go through this unit one homework, so there's really no excuse not to get up to 100. We'll see if I can make 100 the first try. I haven't looked at the answer, so we're going to give it the do the best we can. But let's go and get started with this. So the first one is just definitions. A cost that can be traced to a product, process, department, or customer. Um, these sound like direct costs. They can be actually traced directly, so this is the definition of direct cost. At least I hope so. Uh, B, necessary to create or manufacture a product represented by direct labor. These are product costs. Uh, these uh, products made up of three different costs. So we split all the costs up into one of these three categories. So these sound like product cost. Cost incurred when salaries and wages are incurred to pay employees whose production work is critical to the finished product and represents a significant portion of the cost. This sounds like direct labor. Costs that, that do not change with uh, activity levels, okay, uh, that sounds like a fixed cost, like our rent, potentially, maybe property tax is more fixed in nature, but it doesn't matter how many, if we produce zero units or a million units, it, it's the same amount we had to pay for these costs, they're fixed in nature. Costs that cannot be traced to a product process department. So they're costs of the manufacturing process, but we can't easily trace them. So these are later going to be called factory overhead, but another name for them are indirect costs. Indirect costs are factory overhead, though. Represent the three conditions that must exist for fraud. So he's throwing the fraud triangle concepts in here. Um, what is it? There's they got to have incentive or pressure they, you can call it either word incentive or pressure is one of the three they got to have opportunity and what's the third one? Oh, rationalization they gotta like they gotta do something to rationalize it like if you watch breaking bad they <laughs> the leader there rationalized all that all the unethical things he did just because it was going to benefit his family but you got to have some way to rationalize what you're doing and try and say yeah this really isn't that bad because this or this so those are the three conditions that exist for people who commit fraud not that that's what we want to do made up of direct labor and manufacturing overhead okay these two labor and overhead we combine them together into one term called um, conversion cost non-production costs usually linked to a time period rather than manufactured products Okay, so these are going to be period cost. Uh, the examples are administrative expenses and selling expenses. So we incur these over time, and it's different than a product cost. These two are very different, product and period. Period costs are always expensed 100% the period that they're incurred. Where product costs, uh, they're capitalized on the balance sheet, so they get to be an asset on the balance sheet. We don't expense them until we sell the good. And when we sell it, we usually get revenue associated with it, so it's a positive thing to the income statement. More period costs are just expenses. They go straight to the income statement, straight as an expense, lowering our net income in the current period. So these two costs are treated very differently. What else do we have? Looking at planning decisions and evaluating organizations, activities, and employees. We're going to go with one of the management functions here. I control. Cost that change in proportion. This is definitely a definition of variable costs. So J. Alright, let's get to the journal entries here. Alright, I went ahead and completed this problem. But what we I'm going to show you some other tricks here. This problem would be nice if it had a chart of accounts, um, for example, like raw materials, but I'm sure it's very similar to his notes, so you can get an idea of where the accounts are coming from. Um, raw materials is about the only thing. Accounts payable, we could change to like AP. It'll accept it as well. This is just purchasing the materials on account. It's the first entry. We debit the materials. It's an asset. Credit AP, we owe somebody more money. It's the normal credit balance, so we're both increasing materials and in increasing accounts payable. 
For the next part, it's a breakout between work in process, factory, overhead, materials. And if you want work in process, you can just use the acronym. And factory overhead, you can use an acronym. Materials, again, we're changing that to raw materials. I only know because I can see the key. Um, notice the breakout here. These two add up to be the total. And then the direct materials... Um, or go directly into work in process where the other indirect materials like this could be like the supervisor or the custodial staff quality control employees those are examples of no this isn't labor I'm sorry indirect materials can be something small like maybe glue or something staples screws maybe potentially something small that's used in production but it's not a direct material but it's the goes to factory overhead and we're going to see more about this count later. For the next one we do get to the labor one. So they give us the total labor and they say that they're paying it in cash so we're actually going to credit cash. Um, some of this is direct labor and some of the amount is indirect labor. Indirect labor is like the supervisors, custodial staff, quality control employees are examples of indirect labor. They're not directly working on building the product like the direct labor employees are. So we see the same type of split out where some of it goes into work and process, but the other part goes into factory overhead for the indirect labor. And the total amount is paid out in cash. We can go in, if you don't want to type out work and process, you can just use the acronyms. All right, on the next one on four, paid cash for actual factory overhead cost. Let's talk a little bit about factory overhead. I have an Excel sheet set up here. All right, I already started on some of the other problems, but basically what we want to look at is factory overhead account. This is the T account. It has the actuals on the debit side and the applied amount we're going to see later on the credit side. So this is an actual factory overhead. We're going to debit the account. So that's why we see factory overhead being debited. I'm just going to show you the acronym, FOH. Right, and they give us the amount of 15300 so that's recording actual factory overhead. On the next part, we're going to apply factory overhead. We're going to apply it equal to 80% of the direct labor cost. So to get to the amount, we're going to take 80% of direct labor. So not the total, not the 74300 but 32300 is the direct labor part times 0.8. In order to, uh, we got to convert this to a decimal to put it in a calculator. So we got to move the decimal place over twice. So it's 0.8 is 80 percent, and we get to our amount, the 25840. I'm just going to show you the acronyms. If we didn't want to write work, work in process, we can just call it WIP. And same thing for factory overhead FOH. But this is the application of the factory overhead. It's moving out of the factory overhead account into work in process. So these two would be the same. But so factory overhead, the left side's the actual, the debit side's the actual amount, and the credit side's the amount we have applied. Let's move on. Transferred cost at jaws completed. Okay. So let's look at this overall process here. We have work in process. This is where we mix together our three ingredients, direct material, direct labor, and factory overhead. But whenever, and the cost will stay there until the job is complete. But once it's complete, we'll move it out of work and process and into finished goods. So that's what we're seeing here. Um, and doing these journal entries, since these are all almost all debit balances, we're going to debit the account where it's moving from and credit the account where, I said that wrong. We're going to debit the account where it's going to and credit the account it's coming from. So on six, transferred, it's going to finished goods. So we need to debit finished goods. I don't know if we have an acronym for it, but we definitely do for work in process. So we debit the account it's going to, credit the account it's coming from. On seven, we sold jobs on account uh, on account for 115. Notice there's two different numbers here. 115,000 is the sales price, the 75 is the cost price. We're in business to make money, so it's, it makes sense that the sales price is higher than the cost price. So the first part is accounts receivable, and I recommend using the AR. To represent it, receivable. Otherwise, you got to remember the I before the I before E, except after C rules. A little tricky. And then we have cells. 
Uh, for the last part, we have cost of goods sold and finished goods. So we're moving it into cost of goods sold. I'll show you the T accounts again. So here we're moving it out of finished goods. So we're going to credit finished goods and debit cost of goods sold. Instead of writing out cost of goods sold, we can use an acronym. And then finished goods will credit for the 75000 So these are the entries. I know some of the accounts would be hard to guess. I bet it looks just like the example problem, though. I see a lot of people got it. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. All right, I went ahead and worked ahead of you guys a little bit so I don't make any mistakes. All right, so we're looking right here. I'm going to go and erase some of this work. All right, so so far we've just uh, inputted what the problem gave us. So we want three T accounts here, work in process, finished goods, cost of goods sold. For work in process, we're going to mix together our material, labor, and overhead. These three numbers are the first three given. Let's see where they come from. All right, then we're going to input the beginning and ending balance. So that's where the beginning balance comes in for work in process, and the ending balance is down here. And then we have a beginning balance for finished goods, 11300 and an ending balance for finished goods. We don't know 3400 yet. All right, so this is all the information the problem gives us. Our job is to figure out the cost of goods manufactured, which will be this number, the number that transfers from here to here. And the second part is cost of goods, so that will be the number that transfers from here to here. All right. So let's look at this T account. This story doesn't add up right now. You got four numbers here. These four numbers, if we add them together, are definitely greater than 2100. So what this means is something must have left the account. All the amount left except for the amount that didn't. So we're gonna, I'm going to use Excel to just add these four up. So we'll take the addition of those four numbers and subtract out the ending inventory because it's not finished. So subtract out the ending, but we finished everything else except for the amount we didn't finish. And this is referred to as the cost of goods manufactured. And it will travel to finished goods. Because we're done. The amount that we're done with leaves work in process and goes to finished goods. Now we do the same thing over here for finished goods. We're going to take the summation of all the debits, the total amount in the account. What is Excel doing? And we're going to subtract out the ending balance because we didn't sell the 7900. They're still sitting in finished goods, but we sold everything else. And that amount also travels to cost of goods sold. So there we see the two numbers. You see the 37,800 right here. The amount, this is cost of goods manufactured, and we see the cost of goods sold number right there. But the easiest way is to set up a T account to solve that type problem. Alright, the next question is the factory overhead one. And there is a pretty big weakness with this problem is it doesn't tell you anything about the rounding rules. So that's one thing we're looking to improve in the future. But here, the, this is just based on definition. We get our predetermined, notice the word pre in it. We've determined this before the actual period occurred. So we don't know these actual numbers. So whenever we make this estimate, we don't even have these actual numbers. Um, what we do have are the estimates, and what we do is put the estimated factory overhead on top divided by the cost driver. In this case, they're basing on direct labor costs, so that's our cost driver, so we're going to divide it by 110, 1, 2, 3. And here's what I don't like is we don't, it doesn't tell us anywhere where to round, but I've looked at the key, it's rounding to the nearest percent. Notice this is the decimal to turn it into percent, you move the decimal place over twice, so it'll be 209%. All right, so now we're just going to take the 209% and we're going to see how much we would actually apply to factory overhead. So our actual direct labor cost is 150000 Now we're applying it based on that direct labor cost and we're applying it at a rate of 2.09. So times 2.09, yeah. I know this is in percent, but anytime you put it in a calculator, you need it to be a decimal. And you get to the amount that's applied. Let's go and look at a T account because we're going to need a T account to answer the next part. So 
we will actually have 300,000 of factory overhead and we're going to apply 315,000 of factory overhead. Now, since this application is based on an estimate, humans usually don't estimate exactly right to the dollar. So there's a scenario either way where we could apply too little or we could apply too much. So if this had an ending balance on the debit side, we'd call it underapplied. It doesn't, because if we look at it, this number's higher. Since this number's higher, it's going to be overapplied. So under applied over applied that's just typically how the factory overhead account works you have the actuals on this side you're applied on that side if we didn't apply enough it'll end up on the debit side and be under applied if we applied too much it's called over applied this one the the credits are higher the amount we applied is higher by 13,500 so it's over applied by 13,500 All right, let's get to the tough one, right? This is the process costing problem. It looks like a lot of information, but weighted average is actually the simpler of the two approach. I'm more familiar with FIFO, which is a harder approach, but this one, this one, we just got to pick out the information we need and do the, the appropriate calculations. But let me set up a good example in Excel. All right, here we need to keep track of our units into two categories. The amount that we finished and transferred out and our ending work in process, the ones that we didn't finish. First, I'm just going to do whole units. Uh, somewhere they tell me the end, we transferred out 650,000. Ending work in process, somewhere they tell me at the end of August, 450,000 units. I'm just going to add these two up to get our, to our total units. And then I'm going to standardize the format. All right, but we need to break these up into equivalent units of direct material and equivalent units of conversion cost. Now transferred out is nice and easy. It's 100% across the board. So boom, just write that number across. And it's the same number here for direct material. So the only one that's really different is this cell. We have to do a calculation here. This calculation is going to be equal to the number of units in ending work in process times the percent of how how much completed they are. Right? These goods got 60% complete, so we had to do 60% of the work this period on them. So we've only since conversion costs are added evenly throughout the period, we only account for the amount that we we did this period. We did 60% of the work. The other 40% will be accounted in the next period. We'll finish it. So we get our table this way. I'm going to add up everything. So we have our equivalent units for both uh, direct material and conversion cost now. All right, now we need to get into our rates for both material and our labor. To get into our rates, we need to first deal with our cost. So let's think about beginning cost and then additional cost for both material and labor. The beginning cost for materials... The ending, the direct material added, and okay, so they're giving us the amount that was added. 320123 and for conversion. Remember, conversion is the labor and the overhead. Alright, we still need to find that beginning cost for. Beginning work in process, okay, 50% with respect to conversion. Okay, yeah, he puts, he like, just throws it in a random spots here. But here's our beginning direct materials. Uh, cost. And then conversion of 214, 123. Alright, we're going to add these up to get our total cost. Alright, now we can get our rates for both direct material and conversion cost. All we need to do is take the total cost number divided by the equivalent units. 
So the cost divided by the equivalent units will get us a cost per unit. And we're going to have to figure out the rounding rules here. Alright, we're going to round to the nearest cent here. So, the problem you might run into if you're doing this in Excel is this keeping decimal points. It's actually mathematically more precise to keep these decimal places. Notice it keeps a lot of decimal places. But, I bet this problem is going to round to the nearest cent. So, what I'm going to do is get rid of those extra decimal places. So, I'm going to consider the rate just to be 1.49 and 2.24. So, now it doesn't have those extra decimal places. So we've rounded to the nearest cent. All right, now we get to apply it to the units that were transferred out. We can go up here and call it total cost. All right, for the units transferred out, we have 650 units of direct material times the rate for direct material, plus we have uh, 650,000 equivalent units of conversion times the rate and we're done with it. I know Excel's. All right, same story for the ending. We take the units of direct materials times the rate for direct materials plus the units of conversion times the rate for conversion. Get that. And let's confirm. Okay, I'm looking at the answers are off by a little bit. It's due to rounding. So I'm going to go back and not round these. I'm going to go back to my calculation. The total cost divided by the total units. Total cost divided by the total units. Yeah. All right, so this one would be a little tricky doing it on a calculator. Um, how many decimal places should you keep? Um, I, the more decimal places you keep, the more accurate your answer is going to be mathematically. So more is better. It gives you better accuracy. How many do you need to keep to get it right to the nearest end? I don't know. I'd keep four or five. And you're probably going to get there. I got an Excel. Excel's keeping probably hundreds. I don't know how many it keeps. It just keeps going. going. So. so we do need to keep the keep decimal places. Let's go and just show four or five. I would write it something like that. The more that you show, the closer you're going to get to these actual answers. And I'll look at the test, see if there are. If anything's off by rounding rules, especially if it doesn't tell you the rounding rules, I don't want you to lose points for it. Oh, we're taking the total cost, 2, 4, 2, 3, 8, 1, 9, and 1, 2, 7, 5, 1, 8, 1. All right, but that, that shows you how to get to the correct answer there. I agree the weakness of this problem is the not, not describing what it wants you to do with the rounding because it is important to keep enough decimal places to get to these answers. What do we got? Okay, just activity rates and... Okay, this looks complicated like at first because it's a lot of information, but we're going to divide to get our rates, and then we're going to multiply to apply it to different products. Let me go and get my bearings on this problem, and then we'll solve it. Okay. This problem really isn't hard. There's just two simple steps. There's a lot to do, though. It's kind of a tedious type problem. But the first step is we're going to take the overhead cost for an activity and divide it by its cost driver. So I just needed to write down all these numbers and let Excel do the math for me. And then I'll get the, the uh, cost driver, the quantity. 
I'm going to go and do it for all the other ones too. We're going to need this data. And I'll show you a trick with Excel to calculate all these quickly. All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to use Excel to do this. It's just dividing the total expected cost for that activity divided by its cost driver. And I'm going to use Excel to drag down this formula, so it'll do it for everything. All right, now we're going to have to figure out the rounding. Let's go with two decimal places. Some dollars. We're going to add commas here. So this is the total factory overhead for the activity. And this is the driver. You just take the Total expected factory overhead divided by the cost driver. These would then be our rates for each activity. Are they in order? I think they're in order. Change over machine setup. Yeah, they're in order. So I'm just, I have another screen, so I'm just looking at them, putting these numbers in as the answers. Let me check one. No, he wants the nearest dollar. Yeah, I can see why this would drive some of you a little crazy, too. The first one, he wants the nearest dollar, but then the rest are to two decimal places. Why? Why is it not consistent? Whatever. All right, 246. I have no idea why that one's not round to the nearest cent. The rest of these look like they are going to be round to the nearest cent. Okay, there's a lot I don't like about this problem. We're going to do it anyways. Um, but they're combining these two together into one category, providing space and utility. So on our spreadsheet, I just add those two together. I've concluded that this top one is an error, coded wrong, that the answer is coded wrong. It should be 246.44. I'm going to go ahead and, after this is done, add that as a potential answer to this as well. Alright, so let me finish with the rates here. This one's 877.05, and this one's the total of the two, so 19.22. 
All right, now we get to apply it to the products. So we're going to take our rates. And we're going to need this information, units produced, welding hours. All right, this question has too many things wrong with it. It's too confusing to do. The basic concept, you divide to get your rates, then you multiply to apply it to the product. So it would have a rate for the welding department, um, whichever one's the welding department. And you get your rate times however many hours they used and you would apply it to the products. But there's too much with the rounding rules going on here and other things with this problem. This one just needs to be completely re reworked to be more simple to understand for introductory class. So I'm gonna assign his points to zero. Effectively, you won't need to complete this one. But if you're curious, all you do is divide to get the rate for each one. And then once you have the rate for that department, you would multiply it. This one's number of batches. So batches. Batches right here. Once you had the rate, you would multiply it to apply it. So luxury would get the rate times 600. Standard would get the rate times 430. But I'm going to throw it out with the rounding rules. Yeah, overall, we have a lot of work to do on this. And we're basically planned on the summertime to improve the quality of all these problems. I get it right now, especially with the rounding rules. It needs to be much better refined. Um, but right now, it's something free that we can use and get through the course, and I'm going to look through everything and make sure you get the points that you've earned. And we're also curving things and being understanding of uh, different things, so uh, no one should really be concerned about failing this course. I understand there's a lot of difficulties here, so I'm going to be understanding when I look at the grades. All right, but that's going to conclude it for this video. This problem will be assigned zero points. Let's go and look at the, the other ones. Oh, great. <laughs> Alright, to solve it, we have six questions on the homework. Instead of, I know some students have probably put in some work on that problem. If they got it right, I want them to get some points. So instead of, um, of getting rid of it, we're just going to have it as extra credit. So you notice here there's six problems. You can get up to 120. And I'll show you how and I'm going to turn on the feedback for it because he has feedback for these ones that will give you the answer to so I'm going to make sure that feedback is on yeah the feedback there is on but yeah I know it's a little messy right now that last one I think could use a lot of work some of the other ones could use clarity on the rounding rules but we can do our best and get through it you should be able to get to uh, at least 100 on this one um, and then we'll do one for the unit 2 homework and I'll check over all the exams and see I want to make sure the rounding rules are clear and it's, it's a clear way to get to the correct answer on different things alright I'll see you guys next time for the next video